Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to talk about the great mystery of God. The great mystery of God. You know, understand, I'll tell you the great mystery of God right now, that he literally saved the Gentile people. That he gave the same, same uh, uh, salvation story to the Jewish people that he gave to the Gentile people. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Now, what is the reason for this reason? What reason was Paul talking about? That is the mystery of Christ. What is the mystery of Christ? The plan of God. The purpose of God was that the Gentiles, all of the rest of them, not only the Jewish people, the family of God's family of the children of the Jewish people, that they would have the opportunity to be saved, but that salvation would be opened up to all Gentiles all over the world. Now that has been a wonderful, wonderful ministry, a wonderful mission that people have gone all over the world. I've shared this with you before, I'll say it again. There's not a place that I have gone in this world that you could not find a born-again Christian. I don't care what language they speak. I don't care what, the, what country they're in. There are born-again people in every place all over the world. It was the mystery of Christ that he would come not just for the Jewish people, but for the entire world. Isaiah 49, 6 says, Indeed, he says, it is, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Listen, folks, this plan was all along. God knew that he was going to bring a Jewish Messiah into the world to speak to the Jewish people first and then to open the good news for all the world to hear. You and I have been given that opportunity as Gentiles. Jesus came into this world to save lost sinners. And the Jewish people, some, many of them were saved. Some of them rejected him, which opened the door to all of us Gentiles. One day we're going to stand before the Lord. One day as Gentiles, we're going to stand before God. And we can say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I love that old song. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, uh, for giving me life everlasting. And so what we need to understand, folks, is that this was the plan of God all along. And then we see also in verse 1, the Bible says, Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now what does that mean? Paul a prisoner. Well, first of all, he was confronted by God. Paul was on a different mission. He was on a different road. This Paul was literally going to Damascus to arrest and to kill and to destroy the Christian faith. It was a mission of malice. He had gone to Damascus to arrest Christians. But then that was also a meeting of mercy on the road to Damascus. You see, Paul had no clue. You know, we don't have a clue when we go off on a trip, what may happen. We don't know all the things that are going to go on. But you see, Paul had a vision that I'm going to go to Damascus and I'm going to take care of this Christian people. I'm going to take care of this once and for all. And as he was going, he had a meeting of mercy. God confronted Saul of Tarsus to save him for his work. Of all the people God could choose, of all the people, of all the Jewish people that God could choose to come to we Gentiles, God chose this man named Saul of Tarsus, the man who not only hated his Jewish brethren who were Christians, but also disliked the Gentiles too, I'm sure. But we see that he was confronted by God and he was captured by God. You see, Saul became Paul. 
Here's a very interesting thing. Why did Paul's name change? Why did he just not keep his name Saul? Because the name Saul was an affront to the Christians. You said, I on the door, hello, this is Saul of Tarsus. I've come to talk to you. They're going out the back door. They're not going to want to talk to Saul of Tarsus. So God gave him a new name, Paul. And so we see he had a, his genuine confinement was simple. Paul says here, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. You do understand that Ephesians is one of the epistles that were called the prison epistles. Paul wrote this book of Ephesians to the church at Ephesus while he was imprisoned. And so we see that he was genuinely confined. He was genuinely a prisoner. He had a literal problem there in jail, so to speak, in confinement. His, this was his first Roman imprisonment, and the letter he wrote, the, the book of Ephesians, this, this epistle, was written probably between 60 and 63 A.D. And so we see not only his genuine confinement, Paul was literally imprisoned, but he also we see his godly commission. And what was his godly commission? Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. In verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling from which you were called. We see his, his godly commission was very simple. He was a prisoner of the Lord, and he was telling the Gentiles to walk worthy of the calling for which you were called, to live for Christ. That was Paul's message, to go out and win the Gentiles to Christ, to share the gospel with with the, the Gentiles, but also to teach them how to walk as a Christian. So we see Paul's godly commission. And what was his commission too? Again, the Bible says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Here was Paul, the most unlikely candidate. This is the man that nobody would have said wrote in his high school yearbook. The man most willing to reach the Gentiles for Jesus. That just would not have been put in his yearbook. Paul, of all people. And here he is in Ephesians saying, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles? Tell me there isn't a God in heaven. Tell me that there isn't a God who uses people for you and for me. We see Paul's godly commission. And what was Paul's mission? His mission was to bring the gospel of Christ to the Gentile world. The mystery of God. All the way. Folks, this was not, God just didn't wake up one day and say, well, Jesus died on the cross. I brought him back from the dead. He's serving the Jewish people. Uh, maybe we ought to just open this up to the Gentiles too while we're at it. No, I don't think God had that because I'm going to show you in a little bit how all the way back in Genesis, God knew about this mysterious plan to win the Gentiles. The Jews had no clue. The Jewish people had no clue that God's plan was ultimately to win the whole world. But we see here this text, this first verse literally sets the tone for this chapter. We see in our text two things. We see the mystery is exposed and we see the mystery is explained. What is this mystery? It's a mystery to the Jewish people because God literally reached out to not only the people of God, the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. In verse 2 through 6, we see the mystery exposed. In verse 2 through 4, we see a mystery obtained and a mystery shared. In verse 2, we see the mysterious age is explained in verse 2. The Bible says, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Well, first of all, we see the term, the phrase dispensation of God. That means it's a new age and a different age than before. This is the dispensation of law. It is the dispensation of grace. You see, the age before that was known as the age of the law of God. 
The first testament, the Old Testament, we see started out with, with Abraham and went all the way to Moses. And Moses codified the law and that became the dispensation. You were Jewish people. You were people of God because you observed the law. Because you were included in the Abrahamic covenant. And therefore, when it came to the time of the Ten Commandments and the laws of God, you followed suit with that. And so we see this, that time was known as the age of the law of God. But now we see Paul is telling the people at, at uh, Galatia, or excuse me, Ephesians, that this final testament, this new testament, is the age of the Lord's grace. In John, the first chapter, verse 16 and 17, it says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If we had time, we could go into that first chapter, first two, three chapters of Hebrews, and it talks about how Jesus surpassed all these things. Jesus surpassed the angels. Jesus surpassed uh, all of the Moses. Jesus surpassed the prophets. And he brought grace to the world. And so we see this mysterious thing that everyone was trying to figure out what this mystery is, was the age of God's grace. And that grace was given not just to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles too. In verse 3 and 4, we see the mystery agent. Who's the one that's going to bring this great, great uh, uh, situation, this great mystery to play in the lives of the Gentiles, it was going to be Paul. Look at verse 3 in chapter 3. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already. We see here that Paul received that mystery. Paul was taught by the Lord. He didn't go. Now, Paul was a very educated man. Paul went to some of the best Jewish schools that they had back then. Some of the greatest Jewish minds Paul was a student of. But we see Paul here was not a good student at this time of Christianity. Paul didn't walk around with Jesus like these disciples, these apostles did. They were with Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years. My goodness. It was like an advanced course for them that they went through and found this thing. But Paul had not had that experience. Paul was taught by Christ, however, in the desert in Arabia for three years. Paul left Damascus. He didn't go all the way there. He went to, went to the desert. And there Christ revealed to Paul the mystery of Christ. I love that scriptures in 1 Corinthians when Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper. And he says, the Lord dealt with me. The Lord shared with me this truth. Paul wasn't there. Paul was in his own home having Passover. He wasn't with the disciples. He wasn't with those who were with Jesus. But Jesus came to Paul and taught him, gave him the information that Paul was going to need. And so we see that for three years, he got what Charles Swindoll calls his master's degree in Jesus. <laughs> And so we see there Christ revealed to Paul the mystery of Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, turn a little bit to the left to Galatians. It's the next book over, Galatians chapter 1, and start with verse 15. Paul again received the mystery. Paul was taught. Paul was given this course, a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. He didn't get online, he got in, in on the Lord. That's what he got. So we see here in, in Galatians chapter 1, starting with verse 15. Starting with verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. What did he say? I didn't go to these men, these other disciples, to the apostles, to ask them, what about all of this? Verse 17, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. 
But I went to Arabia, that's the desert, and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. <clears throat> we see that Paul received the teaching of the, men, of, the, of the mystery. And that mystery was that Paul, again, one of the greatest Jewish minds of his time, had all the right credentials, had all the right education, had all the right everything that he needed, that Paul thought he's going to be up and coming in this matter of the Jewish faith, but God called him to be the, the uh, uh, speaker of the mystery of Christ. In verse 4, we see that Paul reveals the mystery. He reveals to mystery. Look at verse 4, back in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already. We see here that Paul was talking about in verse 3, this mystery was given to him. But look at verse 4, by which you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul says, I have the ability, I have the understanding, I have the information that I need to share with you about this mystery. He said, God has revealed this mystery to me. It was Paul's ministry to share the mystery of Christ, which is the gospel, to the Gentiles. Oh, you know, the Gentiles must have thought, why would a Jewish God care for me? You know, our gods don't care for the Jewish people. Why would a Jewish God care for me? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and servants of the mysteries of God. We see that these mysteries was the gospel was open to the Gentiles. All along, this has been thought of, this had been shared, this had been hidden in the scriptures ever since the first book of the Bible in Genesis. The mystery was, was also obscured and it was secured. In verse 5, we see the first part of verse 5 in Ephesians 3, it says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. The mystery was obscured. A lot of the Jewish people, had they had no clue that God was going to reach out to the Gentile people. Oh, you know, if Paul somehow in heaven saw what his work he began, how it's going today. Again, people all over. Paul went to many places there in the known kingdom of Rome, in the empire of Rome. Paul went to these places, but he had no clue where all these, these uh, missionaries were going to go. All these people that Paul had talked to had changed their lives and started churches and began to grow people and win people to Christ going throughout all the world. One day I think maybe we'll see that. Oh yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was saved. Paul led me to the Lord. And then I, I in turn went to my friends in another country, in another place, place of the world and shared Christ with them. And it went from there. So we see that the mystery was obscured. The Bible Knowledge Commentary said this about that first part of verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. They write it like this, God has not revealed this mystery in the past to the extent he has now. They knew that there was a mystery there. They knew that there was going to be an outreach because it says so in, in the Bible. But for some reason, they couldn't grasp it. For some reason, it just didn't hit the noggin right. We see the mystery was contained in Scripture all along. The mystery was first revealed to Abram all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 with the Abrahamic covenant. He says in Genesis 12, 3, God says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, so far, it sounds like a Jewish thing, but then it goes on and says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's pointing to the Gentiles. 
When God says all the families of the earth, he didn't say all the families of Israel. He didn't say all the families of Judea. All the families of, of the land there where you live, Abraham, I'm going to bless. No, he said all the families of the earth. And how were we blessed, beloved? By Jesus. That's the blessing. That's the mystery solved. That the mystery of the coming of Christ who would die for the sins, not just of the Jewish people, but for the whole world. You see, all our sins, every sin we ever committed back then, back in the, the time when Jesus was crucified, all the sins up to that point were placed on Jesus. But to think that all the sins past that point even to today and also tomorrow, were placed on him then too. All our sins were placed on him. Folks, we weren't even alive yet. That's the mystery. How can that happen? But God knows what sins we would commit. God knows what sin we would be involved in. And he took that sin, placed it upon his son, that he would pay the penalty for that sin. That if we would acknowledge that, if we would but believe that, receive that forgiveness, acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, acknowledge him as the Savior of mankind, acknowledge him to, he came to die for our sins, rose from the dead to give us life everlasting, and then invite him into our heart, we could have the forgiveness of those sins. That was the mystery. All the way back in Genesis, all the way back, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's a mystery. What in the world? They must have thought about that for ages and for generations. What does that scripture mean? What did Moses mean when he wrote that? Moses said, I don't know, I just wrote it. You know, God gave it to me, I wrote it down. But oh, beloved, we see that Paul now knows the mystery. He was taught about the mystery. And now he's going through, the, er, going through the world speaking about the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ coming to the Gentiles. So Paul not only received the mystery, but he revealed the mystery. Again, that mystery was obscured in verse 5. The mystery was contained in scripture. The mystery was confused in speculation. Many had been deceived by the assumption of religious speculation. I have a friend who writes a lot, and he says to me, is it wrong to speculate when you read? I said, no, as long as it doesn't take away from the Scripture. Now, if it's contrary to Scripture, it is wrong. And that's just as simple as can be. And so what we see that many, though, have been, been deceived by the assumption of religious speculation. A good example of that, let me give you a good example of someone who was tricked by uh, religious speculation. We know the story of Jacob, who basically went to go work for his uncle Laban. And uncle Laban said, hey, I, I see you've been making eyes at my daughter Rachel over there. Yeah, yeah, I really like her. I tell you what, you work for me for seven years and I'll let you marry her. Jacob says, you got a deal, and so he did. And so that wedding night, Jacob decided that, hey, I'll just take Laban's word for it. Leah was, was literally veiled. He couldn't even see who she was there. And when he woke up in the morning, guess what? It wasn't Rachel, it was Leah. And you see, that's what a lot of people did about this mystery. They didn't look under the veil. They didn't check out what God was saying. They didn't check out. They weren't deceived. They were self-deceived. And so we see that, that we must understand that the scriptures are real and strong and important. And that mystery has been ever since the book of Genesis. They were not looking for God's salvation of the Gentiles. They were looking for the law. They were looking how to live the law. They were looking on how that am I going to stand before God with all these sins that I have and the law that I've been following has it really given me the forgiveness I need. So we see the mystery is obscured in, in religion. It's obscured in people's uh, uh, assumptions. 
We see in verse 5, the latter part of verse 5 and verse 6, the mystery is obtained. Which in other ages were not made known to the sons of men. Here it comes, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. This is the mystery obtained. In verse 5b, we see by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says prophecy was revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. The Bible was revealed to the writers of the Bible by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so we see that, that the, the scriptures, these prophecies, these mysteries were given to these people to write down uh, by the Holy Spirit. And then we see by realization of the Holy, of the Holy Scriptures in verse 6. The Bible says that the Gentiles should be fellow partakers of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. What is that? That's the Scriptures. The Scriptures talk about the Lord coming to die for the sins of the world through the gospel. And what is that? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not come into the world to, to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Understand, beloved, that this mystery has been revealed. We see the revelation of the Holy Scriptures. The Bible prophesied that the Gentiles would be reached. They just didn't grasp it. They just, did, they just glossed over it. Psalm 98.3, the Bible says, He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness. To the house of Israel, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Again, all the ends of the earth Who's that speaking of? The Gentiles. You and me. There are some of us who didn't live pretty close to each other. We lived in far away from each other. I grew up here in Fort Wayne the most of my life as a, as a child. And so we understand that this the Holy Spirit came and spoke to my heart, made this mystery available to me as he did many of you wherever you were born. And understand that that mystery went throughout all the world. It didn't say only to certain people, just to the nation of America, no. Not just to the nation of England, no. Not just to the nation of Israel, no, but to the whole world. So we see the prophecy of the Gentiles being reached. And then we see in verses 7 through 12, the mystery is explained. Look at verse 7 and 8, revealed through a servant. In verse 7, we see a servant to the glorious gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Paul said, God chose me. Of all the disciples, of all the apostles, God chose me. That's why it, 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 the apostles didn't go to all these other places like Paul did. Many of them went nearby. Some of them went to different foreign countries too. But Paul was sent to the Gentiles. And we see in verse 7, first of all, a gift of God's grace. Paul was a minister of God's grace, not law. Paul went to them. Paul was a student of the law. Paul understood the law more than everybody. That's why I believe that God chose Paul, because Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul was a very educated man in the thing called the law. You look at the book of Romans, my goodness, Paul tells us all about the law and tells us all about the gospel. It's a, it's a wonderful writing about this truth. We see again, he, he was a gift of God's grace. Romans 1.15 says, So as much as is in me, Paul is writing, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul wrote that letter to the Romans before he had even gone to Rome. 
He said, I, I want to come and I want to preach the gospel to you. And we see that Paul eventually had that opportunity. And then we see a gift of God's glory by the effective working of his power. God willed this. God opened the door for Paul. Now, Paul chose to follow. Paul chose, of course, it didn't help that he got knocked off his horse there on the road to Damascus. And God said, okay, you're persecuting me, Saul. And Saul says, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus. And Paul thought to himself, oh, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> but you see, God chose Paul from that point, Saul at that point, to become Paul, the great minister of the gospel. We see not only is it a gift of God's grace, but it was a gift of God's glory by the effective working of his power, speaking of God's power. Paul says, I'm not, this is not by me. I don't have this power. Paul literally was educated in the matter of Judaism, but suddenly he became an educated man by the Holy Spirit for the aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the Gentiles. That word power in there in verse 7, by the effective working of his power, is the work uh, dynamis, which means miraculous power. Paul says, I have received the effective workingness of his miraculous power. Paul says, this, this is not by accident. This is not something I did. This is something God gave me. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power. Same word, same Greek word. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Oh, most people would never have suspected that in that particular portion of Scripture, to the end of the earth, Jesus was pointing to Paul or Saul of Tarsus. If you would have told those early Christians, Saul's going to become a great man for Jesus. He's going to be a great minister to the, of the gospel to the world and to the Gentiles. They would have said, oh, maybe there's a different Saul of Tarsus here. But we see it was a mystery. It was a miraculous power, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. That's how you got saved. That's how I got saved. That's exactly how Saul got saved. We, did, may not, we may have not gotten knocked off our horse, but there are a lot of different ways God can get our attention. My dad went through three telephone poles in the middle of a Lincoln Continental holding on to the seat, no seat belts back then, hit a concrete embankment on a bridge and was pinned in the wreckage for hours. Went to the hospital. The doctors thought he was going to die, so they just put him out on a cart out in the hallway. My, my uncle came by and said to them, the doctors, if you don't take this man in and do some work on him, his family's going to own this hospital. Well, they took my dad in. My dad died on the operating table. They resuscitated him, brought him back. And then he had this experience where God, he says, God, if you'll give me another chance, I'll do what you want me to do. That Monday morning... There came a, a preacher in through the door, knocked on the door. He walked in. My dad had just come out of his coma, and the preacher says to him, I'm here to, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. And my dad says, I'm here to tell you I'm ready to listen. He led my dad to the Lord, just happened to be later on my father-in-law, married his daughter. But he had this wonderful opportunity to win my dad to Christ. Oh, we see the miraculous power. Oh, he didn't knock everybody off their horse. He didn't put everybody through three telephone poles and a concrete embankment. But he does literally come to our hearts and give us that opportunity. In verse 8, we see a servant of the generous grace. In verse 8, to me who am less than the least of all the, the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. We see Paul, a person least worthy, who am less than the least. We see Paul wasn't saying that God had made a mistake. What Paul was saying, if God can use me, he can certainly use anyone. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul said, I, I, I don't deserve this. But God called him. You say, I, I don't deserve the salvation of Christ. Get in line. None of us did. But he still gave it to us. And we have that opportunity to share the love of Christ with others. And then we see Gentiles, a people least worthy in verse 8. The Bible says, I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I should preach to the Gentiles. Oh, beloved of all people, all people, they were not worthy of Christ's love. But you see, it was a promise of Old Testament prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Folks, this mystery had been shared all throughout the Old Testament, but they had no clue. Why weren't the Jews going out to the Gentiles? Why weren't the Jewish people all doing that? Now, they had some Gentile converts from time to time, but nobody was going out like missionaries like Paul. So we see the Gentiles were the least worthy in the minds of people, but God loved them. In verse 9 through 12, we see redeemed through a Savior. Look at verse 9 and 10, the revelation of the mystery. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We see in verse 9 the mystery of the ages, hidden in mystery. Oh, for some reason they just didn't catch it. For some reason they just didn't grasp it. But God literally changed the world with a man who was breathing hatred and anger against the Jewish Christians to go to Damascus to destroy them once and for all. God literally stopped him in his tracks. A man who was not worthy to share the love of Jesus with others, let alone to receive it himself. And we see that the purpose was this mystery of the ages, yes, but in verse 11, the reason of the mystery was the purpose of Christ to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, folks, there is no one so deep that God is not deeper still. There is no one so lost that God is not able to find him. We see the purpose of Christ in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul was a very religious Jewish man. Paul really knew the Jewish faith but God loved him and God saved him. We see also in verse 11, the plan of Christ. Note it was to, to restore that which had been lost. In verse 11, again, the Bible says, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what was the eternal purpose? Adam and Eve had lost their relationship with God. They had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and God could no longer redeem them. They had to come by the blood. They had to come by the sacrifice of the Lamb. And so we see that God had a purpose and a plan to seek and to save that was lost, but the plan of Christ was to restore that which had been lost in the Garden of Eden at the fall. Turn a little bit to the left to Ephesians, the first chapter. Again in verse 4 through 6. The Bible says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God saw you before the world was even created. The foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, by which he made us acceptable 
in the beloved of the beloved being Jesus. So we see, folks, the plan of Christ all along from the Garden of Eden, even before the world was even made, God knew that you and I were going to be saved. We see we have confidence or courageous assurance, excuse me, we have this plan in Christ. And then we see in verse 12 the result of the mystery. We have a courageous assurance. Look at verse 12 back in Ephesians 3. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Oh, we have a courageous assurance in our faith. By faith in Christ, we can approach God. We have the ability to go beyond the curtain of the temple. We have the ability to go beyond the, the curtain of the tabernacle and go before the very throne of God and speak to him in prayer. We see we have this courageous assurance. In 1 Chronicles verse 28, uh, chapter 28, verse 20, it says, And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work of the service of the house of the Lord. The Lord is always with you, folks. The Lord is always going to be with you, even to the end of the age, even to you and I close our eyes in mortal slumber. One day we're going to see Jesus face to face. One day we're going to take him by the hand and he's going to say, welcome home, beloved. So we see we have this courageous assurance. In verse 12, we also have confident access by our faith in Christ. Jeremiah 17, 17 says, do not be a terror to me. You are my hope in the day of doom. Oh, folks, listen. God is our hope in the day of doom. In the day of death, God is our hope. And so we see the result of that mystery, a courageous assurance and a confident access. Finally, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says, Therefore I ask you that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul talks about his suffering for Christ. That we might know the extent of God's love and salvation. Paul suffered immensely. Paul could tell the people who questioned him. He'd say to them, you show me your love for Christ by your words and I'll show you my love for Christ by my back. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus Christ. Oh, beloved, there is, I don't believe there's anyone of his time that Paul loved Jesus more than all of them. He went through terrible things, beaten by rods, stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked for the Lord. But we see that he was telling them, I've suffered for you. I've suffered so that Christ could come to you. And so we, we might know the extent of God's love and his salvation. Philippians 1.14 says, And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Oh, beloved, we have brothers and sisters all over this world who suffer immensely. Some of them even pay the ultimate price of martyrdom. Should that make us quake in fear? Should that cause us to go hide in, in our closets or in, in a place where nobody could find us? No, it gives us confidence that we know that even in times like this, like Paul says, even in times of suffering, Christ was with him. So Paul suffered for Christ, but also Paul suffered for others, that we might find comfort in our suffering. In the Second Corinthians chapter uh, 1 and verse 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 6. I love this chapter because it starts out talking about why we suffer. In chapter 1 and verse 6, as soon as I get there, now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. 
which is effective for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. What does that mean? Paul says, I, I'm undergoing this for you. That Christ loves you so much that he's willing to allow me to suffer. So I can tell you, as, as Corey Tim Boom's sister Betsy told her there in the concentration camp, there they had been arrested by the Nazi Germans for, for uh, hiding Jews from the Nazis. They were in a concentration camp, and Betsy said to Corey, Corey, you're going to be released soon. And when you're released, you go tell everyone that there's no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. And she says, Corey, they'll believe you because you were there. And oh, beloved, sometimes God takes us through the trials. Sometimes he takes us through things so that we can be a comfort to others. Paul says very simply, I suffered for you that you might understand the strength of God in my life. And oh, beloved, that's what we need to do. We need to live for Jesus. As Paul spoke about his suffering, we need to take that suffering and go and be with uh, the Lord by strengthening our lives to share with others. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this time you've given us and for the opportunity is ours to be again once more in your house. And oh, Father God, I thank you for your word and the truth of it and how Paul, the great man of God, suffered and, and, and dealt with pain and suffering and loneliness and sorrow. And oh, how he loved you, Lord, and loved the people that he shared the gospel with. And oh, Father God, give us strength, give us encouragement that no matter what do we do, no matter where we go, no matter what happens to us, that we will love the Lord and that we will live our lives in this great mystery that we were saved by Jesus Christ ever since the Garden of Eden. And oh, Father God, give us strength and give us encouragement on this time, Father, as we open your word, remind us of your love and your mercy and your grace. Be with us now. Help us to make the decision, Father, that our lives ought to reflect your love and your mercy and your grace. Be with our brothers and sisters, Father, who suffer for the Lord. We lift them up to you and ask that you give them strength and encouragement. And be with us, Father, as we go through what we endure in life that we might say that there is hope in Christ. And, oh, Father God, be with those who are without Jesus. Help them to understand there's no such thing as, as a man or a woman without sin. That we're all sinners. We're all in that same boat. And, oh, Father God, help them to understand that that boat is sinking, death is coming. But that Jesus, the Son of God, came and paid the price for that sin that he hung upon the cross to take their sins upon him, and that he was placed in a grave and rose from the dead to give them life everlasting. And, oh, Father God, remind them that he, you love him. You love them. And I ask, Father God, you give them strength to receive Christ in this prayer time, that they might receive him as their Savior, that they might pray something like this and mean in their heart, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I realize that I, I have sinned. And that sin is a blight on my life. And dear Jesus, I realize that death is coming. But also that you paid that price of death for me. And you rose from the dead to give me life everlasting. And now Jesus, I open the door of my heart and ask you to come into my heart and save my soul. And to the best of my ability, Jesus, I'll live the rest of my life for you. I thank you, Lord. As we continue in prayer, Father God, help those who prayed that prayer to make that decision public, whether here in a service or at home somewhere to share with a family member or friend. And, oh, Lord, give us strength that we might live and be thankful for the mystery of the gospel, that we Gentiles were included in the salvation plan. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian.